Hello everyone and welcome back to another reaction. Today we are watching the next part in the Napoleonic War series by Epic History TV. Today we are watching the Battle of Aspern 1809. So without further ado, let's get going. An Epic History TV History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In 1809, France under Napoleon Bonaparte was the most powerful nation in Europe. But the French Emperor's invasion of Spain and Portugal the previous year had failed to deliver the easy victory he'd expected. And with many of Napoleon's best troops and commanders now tied down in Spain, an old enemy prepared to challenge France once more. The court of Vienna is behaving very badly. It may have cause to repent. Austria had been preparing for war with France since her last humiliating defeat at Austerlitz in 1805. Now, with Napoleon busy in Spain and a British promise of cash subsidies, plus a supporting attack in Northern Europe, it looked like the ideal time to strike. Yes, um, the Austrians were very encouraged by the French intervention in Spain, and Austria tried to exploit the situation to avenge past defeats and reclaim some of the territory that I had lost to France through multiple wars at this point, uh, many of them to Napoleon himself personally. However, oh, the problem for Austria is they kind of lacked any allies in Central Europe. Uh, Russia had um, allied themselves with France in 1807 and Prussia was really not in any condition to put up a fight at this point. The treaties of Tilsit had put severe restrictions on Prussia's military power and they had just been beaten a few years back and so they weren't really in a position to help the Austrians out. Now, in an effort to secure Russian support, France organized uh, the so-called Congress of Erfurt. Here Napoleon basically tried to charm Alexander I by putting on a grand display of sorts. The media made him a very great conference involving a vast array of kings, princes, dukes, barons, and other notables from all over Europe. Uh, among the other attendees were, for example, uh, actors, poets, such as uh, Goethe, and uh, philosophers. So uh, what kind of came out of the Congress of Erfurt was basically the so-called Erfurt Convention, which called on Britain to cease its hostile activities towards France. The Russian conquest of Finland from Sweden was recognized officially and it was stated that in case of war with Austria, Russia would aid France to the best of their ability. Now, here is the case that Austria had managed to convince the Russians secretly uh, to not really do anything in this upcoming war against France and as such they were able to concentrate all of their forces fighting Napoleon because they knew that Russia would, despite the terms of the Erfurt Convention, remain de facto neutral. This time Austria's armies would be led by Archduke Charles, Emperor Francis's younger brother. At 37 he was two years younger than Napoleon but already had 15 years experience of high command. Yes, Archduke Charles would become one of Napoleon's uh, more skilled opponents. However, he had seen action a long time before facing off against Napoleon. He commanded the armies fighting against the revolutionary armies, French revolutionary armies during the 1796 campaigns and uh, was able to beat them off and it was only through Napoleon's uh, victorious Italian campaign that the war could be brought to a successful conclusion. So yeah, Archduke Charles is a formidable opponent. And he was learning from past defeats. He'd begun to reform the Austrian army along French lines, copying Napoleon's core system and introducing new infantry tactics. And uh, one thing before we get into the infantry tactics that I should mention is that Austria did manage to secure British financial aid, which was desperately needed at this point. 
because uh, the Austrian Empire was in a financially dismal state, and they also got the promise of a supporting attack in the lowlands. So there's something for them at least. In the Napoleonic Wars, infantry fought in close order, packed together, standing shoulder to shoulder. But why present such an easy target for the enemy? First, command and control. Before radios, orders had to be relayed by shouted commands, drums or bugles. Difficult enough in the smoke and din of battle. Almost impossible if troops were scattered. Second, firepower. Smoothbore muskets were inaccurate beyond about 80 yards, so volley fire, firing en masse, was the best way to inflict physical and psychological damage on the enemy. Third, morale. Soldiers were much more willing to advance into danger or hold the line if they did so together as a unit, urging each other on. Fourth, defense against cavalry. Scattered infantry were easy targets for horsemen. Only by sticking together, could they fight them off? The basic tactical unit of infantry was the battalion. A French line battalion had, in theory, 840 men, but in practice, nearer five to 600. Our example here has 605 men, a typical strength for a battalion on campaign. The men were divided into six companies, four fusilier companies and two flank companies. On the right, the grenadiers, made up of the tallest, strongest men, often detached to form elite all-grenadier units. Yes, and despite their name, the grenadiers did not throw any grenades at this point. Uh, that function had been uh, removed from the grenadiers, though they kept their names. Now, the grenadiers, as they said, consisted of the tallest and strongest men in the army, and they were basically the elite shock troops. And uh, they were detached, as they say, to form all elite grenadier battalions. So these were very valuable troops. And on the left, the Voltigeurs, specialist light infantry used for skirmishing in front of the battalion. Skirmishers moved independently, used cover and fired at will to harass and unsettle the enemy while preventing enemy skirmishers carrying out the same task. Most armies also had specialist light infantry units for this role, such as the British 95th Rifles, French Chasseurs à Pied, and Austrian and Prussian Jäger battalions. The traditional battlefield formation was the line. All companies formed up alongside each other, three ranks deep. Line formation maximized the number of men who could fire their muskets at the enemy and limited casualties from artillery fire. Yes, and in addition to that, a line formation allows you to control uh, larger portions of the battlefield since your line is so stretched out. But it was extremely vulnerable to cavalry if it could be outflanked. And even for well-drilled troops, it was difficult to keep the line straight while advancing across broken ground. Yes, considering the amount of ditches and other obstacles that uh, you would find on a battlefield, it was a very hard to keep the line straight, and that's what you needed to do. So uh, you had to find other ways of going about moving on the battlefield at times. So for maneuver and attack, Battalions usually formed a column of divisions. This was a more flexible formation that allowed the battalion to advance quickly, though it presented a larger target to enemy guns, firing solid round shot that would tear through several ranks, and far fewer men could fire their muskets at the enemy. Theoretically, therefore, the battalion would deploy into line before reaching the enemy. But carrying out this slow maneuver under fire wasn't always possible or sensible. So some commanders kept their men in column, relying on momentum to break the enemy line. 
This was a risky tactic that often worked against raw troops, but led to high casualties when facing better trained infantry, like British redcoats. A column could be closed up quickly to provide protection from cavalry, or if there was time, could form a square. With bayonets fixed, the battalion formed an all-round defence that often resembled more of a rectangle. Enemy cavalry could surround the battalion, but not break in, as horses won't charge a solid wall of men and steel. But an infantry square was extremely vulnerable to artillery fire, and could only move very slowly. Changing quickly and smoothly from one formation to another, especially under fire, required training, practice and experience. In 1809, the Austrian army began to use the battalion mass formation. Crude, but more suited to hastily trained conscripts. This was a dense column with limited firepower and huge vulnerability to enemy cannon. But it could quickly close up to repel cavalry using the same principle as the square, but without the complex drill, and was much more maneuverable. Napoleon, warned by his spies that Austria was preparing for war, left Spain and raced back to Paris, arriving on the 24th of January, 1809. Yeah, so at this point, Austria had built the largest army it had ever fielded in its history, though the fighting quality was uh, hampered by numerous factors, not least because the men were conscripted from across the Austrian Empire, which was extremely diverse and included Austrians, Hungarians, Czechs, Poles, Croats, Serbs. So this caused some problems with command and control, and especially so with morale, considering the Hungarians, for example, weren't exactly eager to fight the wars of their Austrian rulers. And the conscription focused on the lower classes of society and private soldiers, so most of the non-commissioned officers and many of the junior officers turned out to be illiterate, which is not ideal, you could say. The French army in Germany, commanded by Marshal Berthier, would need urgent reinforcement. So Napoleon summoned units from Spain, called up young conscripts and soldiers from his German allies in the Confederation of the Rhine. La Grande Armée was no longer the finely honed instrument of 1805, but with Napoleon at its head, it was still a formidable force. Archduke Charles ordered diversionary attacks in Poland and northern Italy, but launched his main attack against France's ally, Bavaria, on the 10th of April. It came a week earlier than Napoleon had expected and caught the French Emperor by surprise. Charles was relying on a rapid advance, but a last-minute change of plans, torrential rain, and a slow-moving baggage train slowed progress to a crawl. Marshal Berthier was a brilliant chief of staff to Napoleon, but an indecisive field commander. His forces were too widely dispersed, and Marshal Davout's Third Corps was dangerously isolated at Regensburg. Yes, uh, though the blame for this is not entirely on Berthier's shoulders, um, as Napoleon's orders had in fact arrived rather fragmented and out of order no less. So, as a result, Berthier poorly interpreted the orders sent by Napoleon, and, well, it's kind of ironic considering that Berthier was the one who uh, often issued all the orders to the commanders in the field, yet he could not interpret Napoleon's orders on this occasion. So uh, this really proves that he was more accustomed to staff duties than to field command. Charles ordered his corps to converge and destroy it. But on the 17th of April, Napoleon arrived at Donauwert to take over command. He immediately ordered Davou to withdraw from his exposed position. It was too late for him to escape without a fight. Davout's Third Corps was one of the best in the Grande Armée, and in a fast-moving battle across wooded hills, 
the heroes of Auerstadt threw back the Austrians. Despite the heroism of General Major Liechtenstein, badly wounded, leading his troops forward. Third Corps escaped the encirclement. The Battle of Teugenhausen was the start of Napoleon's so-called four-day campaign. First, he used Marshal Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps and a provisional corps under Marshal Lannes to drive a wedge into the Austrian army. Then he pursued its left wing towards Landshut, believing he was following the main Austrian army. French troops and their German allies stormed the town's bridge to win a hard-fought victory. But Napoleon realized that Archduke Charles was not at Landshut, and that, once again, he'd left Marshal Davout to face the main enemy force. Sending Marshal Bessieres in pursuit of the Austrian left wing, Napoleon swung north, falling on the Austrian 4th Corps at Ecmu. The French and their German allies won their fourth victory in as many days. But Charles's main force was still intact, and hoping to keep it so, he ordered a rapid retreat across the Danube. The French pursued, storming the walled city of Regensburg, which they knew as Ratisbon, with its vital stone bridge. Napoleon put Marshal Lannes in charge of the assault. When the attack faltered, Lannes threatened to lead the next charge in person, and his men, suitably chastised, took the city. Now, Marshal Lan was one of the absolutely best generals, perhaps the best uh, general, marshal, whatever you want to call it, that Napoleon had available. And this incident is um, one that proves this. He was actually physically restrained by his aides from picking up a ladder and storming off by himself. And as they said, their men felt very ashamed that the they would let their commander get exposed to such danger. And as such, on the fourth attempt, as it was, they managed to storm the city. During the siege, Napoleon was hit in the foot by a spent bullet, causing widespread alarm. But it proved to be a superficial wound. Yes, and I believe it was actually canister shot, so uh, that could have turned out badly. Now, a, getting hit in the leg might not seem like much, but back then, you have to remember, medical science had not come that far, and such a wound could easily lead to an infection that eventually led to death. So it was no joking matter. Stubborn Austrian resistance had allowed Archduke Charles and his army to escape across the Danube. Napoleon had cut the Austrian army in half, but both sections now retreated in good order towards Vienna. Napoleon led his forces in pursuit, detaching Lefebvre's Bavarian corps to deal with a popular revolt in Tyrol. Yes, in the Tyrol, a man named Andreas Hofer, an innkeeper and drover, started an armed insurrection against the Bavarian rule in the area. And that actually resulted in some early victories. Uh, but uh, the rebellion came uh, about as a result of uh, Bavarian legislation and compulsory vaccination program that was ordered by King Maximilian I of Bavaria. And they did not want this, and so they uh, started an insurrection, basically. Now, Offer initially managed to free Tyrol of Bavarian occupation. However, after the peace treaty between France and Austria was signed, some troops were freed up, and which enabled them to put down the revolt. Hoffer went into hiding, but he was betrayed by one of his men, and he was executed by the French in 1810. But this rebellion also helped inspire other smaller-scale rebellions in Italy, for example. So it was not insignificant in that sense. And it was quite a large rebellion that required some effort by the French and Bavarians to put down. And 3rd Corps and the Württemberg 8th Corps to guard his line of communications. 
Charles chose not to defend the capital, which surrendered on the 13th of May after a short bombardment. Instead, Charles and the Austrian army lay in wait across the Danube. Napoleon was now down to 80,000 men, facing 110,000 Austrians. Charles's army had fought bravely and well throughout the campaign. But Napoleon still had a low opinion of Austrian troops and decided to attack. A lesson which would cost him dearly. To cannon, all men were equal. That is true, it's quite an equalizer, isn't it? On the night of the 20th of May, French engineers hastily built a series of floating bridges between the river islands of the Danube. And French troops began to cross. By noon the next day, Napoleon had most of Massena's 4th Corps and his cavalry across the river, about 24,000 men and 40 guns, holding the villages of Aspern and Essling. Napoleon expected the Austrians to retreat once more, Yes, and it's this expectation that led them to construct these floating bridges that were not fortified, and that would have major consequences for the rest of this battle. And that he'd only face a rear guard. But reports soon arrived that the entire Austrian army was advancing against him in five attack columns, 90,000 men and 300 cannon. The situation got even worse. The Austrians began to float heavy barges and obstacles downriver to smash through the flimsy French bridge. Each time, Napoleon's only supply route was cut off for several hours, causing critical delays to the arrival of reinforcements and ammunition. The battle began around 2.45 p.m as infantry of the Austrian 1st Column attacked Aspern. The village was soon under attack from three sides. General Molitor's French garrison clung on desperately, fighting hand-to-hand -hand in the streets and suffering 50% casualties. To support the defenders of Aspern, Napoleon ordered cavalry to charge the Austrian third column. Yes, so the Austrian attacks on Aspern were pretty poorly coordinated, and that's why they weren't able to capture the, the town on the first day of this battle. But they could not break through the Austrian infantry, closed up in their battalion mass formation. At 6 p.m., Archduke Charles ordered General Bellegarde's second column to take Aspern at any cost. Charles himself rode among the front ranks, urging the men forward. In ferocious fighting, the Austrians took the village. Napoleon immediately sent in newly arrived reinforcements. More like they took the western half of the village, but I digress. Forcements to recapture it. About the same time, the Austrian 4th Column began its attack on the village of Essling, where Marshal Lann had taken charge of defences while he waited for his own corps to cross the Danube. The first Austrian assault was repulsed. The veteran French cavalry commander, General Despagne, led his cuirassiers in pursuit, but was hit by grape shot and died of his wounds. Around 9 p.m., the Austrian 5th Column finally arrived in position and made its first attack against Essling, which was thrown back by Land's troops. As night fell, firing died out across the battlefield, and men got what rest they could among the dead and the wounded. Overnight, 2nd Corps and the Imperial Guard crossed the Danube to reinforce Napoleon's army, which now numbered 71,150 guns. 
But then the bridge broke again, leaving Davout's Third Corps still waiting to cross. Nevertheless, Napoleon decided to attack, using Second Corps to break the Austrian centre. But first, Aspern would have to be retaken. Heavy fighting broke out in the village before dawn. By 7am, it was back in French hands. At Essling, fresh Austrian attacks were fought off by General Lasalle's cavalry and units of the Young Guard. Yes, so the Young Guard was basically an elite unit made out of the best conscripts from each year's intake. Now we will get into the Imperial Guard in a specialized video one of these days, I believe, but suffice it to say, it's a good unit which was used by Napoleon often, especially later on in his uh, career. With both flanks secure, Napoleon launched his main attack in the center with Land's second corps. Now, uh, this main attack in the center was designed to give enough time for Davout's three corps to get across the river, but they never did, uh, thanks to the obstacles that the Austrians kept floating down the river. Austrian guns poured fire into the advancing French ranks. General Saint-Hilaire, leading the attack, a hero of Austerlitz and Jena, had his foot blown off, a wound that proved fatal. Yes, uh, General Saint-Hilaire was very talented and uh, was very liked by Napoleon. However, of course, he lost his life here and this is the thing uh, that keeps happening. Now, in, Napoleon is going to lose some very talented generals and marshals from this point onwards, which will severely cripple his war effort in the future. And uh, I believe Saint-Hilaire could have made marshal. It's not impossible. Archduke Charles sent his grenadier reserve forward to strengthen the line. The French infantry, under torrential fire, began to fall back. At this critical moment, the French bridge over the Danube was broken again, halting the vital flow of reinforcements and ammunition to Napoleon's army. By 2 p.m., the French had been driven out of Aspern once more. Heavy fighting continued in Essling, which was briefly captured by the Austrians, then retaken by the Young Guard. Yes, that's interesting because uh, the Austrians, uh, Austrians took all of this thing, except the uh, one staunchly defended granary. And Napoleon had sent the guard under General Rapp to support a withdrawal from the village, since Napoleon was planning to withdraw entirely um, in any time now. So what actually happened was that Rapp disobeyed this order from Napoleon, and he led a bayonet charge that drove out the Austrians from the village. And he was commended for doing this by Napoleon. Napoleon knew his army could do no more. At 4 p.m. he ordered his exhausted cavalry to make a last charge to keep the enemy at bay, then gave the order to retreat. Archduke Charles, whose own army had suffered huge losses and was low on ammunition, was content to watch the French withdraw to the island of Lobau. In the final moments of the battle, Marshal Lannes, one of Napoleon's finest commanders and closest friends, was hit by a cannonball that smashed both his legs. He died of his wounds a week later. Yes, the loss of Marshal Land was an especially severe blow to Napoleon. Not only was Land a close and trusted friend of Napoleon, but he was, as I said previously, perhaps his best marshal. And he was one of the few marshals that were capable of independent command. And that is something he so sorely needed uh, later down the line. It was a deep blow to the Emperor. What a loss for France, and for me. The two-day Battle of Aspern-Essling was Napoleon's first major defeat,
caused by his overconfidence and hasty planning. Yes, actually this was Napoleon's first battlefield loss since uh, losing at Acre in Egypt. Uh, which uh, coincidentally occurred, this battle uh, occurred, uh, the Battle of Acre rather, occurred 10 years and one day uh, before. So, <laughs> 10 years on the dot basically since uh, Napoleon last lost. Both sides suffered heavy losses, and Napoleon avoided a much greater disaster only because of the exhaustion of the Austrian army. The French Emperor had learned new respect for the Austrians. Under Archduke Charles, they had fought bravely, with greater confidence, organization and leadership. Within days of his defeat, Napoleon had summoned reinforcements to join him on the Danube, and begun planning his revenge. If you'd like to learn more... Alright, that was uh, Napoleon defeated at Aspern, 1809, and... Uh... Next time we'll watch the Battle of Wagram, 1809. I'm looking forward to that, but until then, I'll see you guys later. Bye!